Hi everyone, welcome to another Street Entrepreneurs Workshop. Uh, today we have the pleasure of ha having Neil Sony, the author of um, Startup Sta, the Startup Goldmine, How to Tap the Hidden Innovation Agenda of Large Companies to Fund and Grow Your Business. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, I'm really excited for this. Uh, this is uh, this is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm really excited for this too. Um, so you've had the pleasure of working with both large companies and startups um, to to find a way of of merging the two and finding the gold nuggets in each. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, usually uh, well sometimes easier easier than others. Uh, some instances are easier than others, but uh, we'll get into all of that in the presentation today. Awesome. Feel free to well, get started. So like. I will share my screen. Just give me a second. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. And now, uh, there we go. All right. Um, so yeah, as uh, Juliana introduced, um, my name is Neil Sony, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to leverage the innovation agendas of large companies to sell, partner, and grow your business. So just uh, a little bit on my background. Um, so as Juliana mentioned, I, I uh, published a book a couple of years back uh, on this exact topic um, called The Startup Goldmine, but it was really based on my experience kind of being in both sides of the table. So I've uh, led an innovation group, an external innovation group to be specific um, at the Estee Lauder companies. Uh, but before that, I led growth and um, founded a couple other companies. So before uh, kind of sitting on the large company side of the table, I was uh, I was kind of selling into those exact same people on the on the, the startup side. And so that gave me a real appreciation for kind of what the problems both sides face. Um, and I think because of that, I bring a little bit more empathy to each side because I know uh, and we'll get into this more, but uh, you know, large companies are not being slow because they want to be slow, or they're not being, uh, you know, they're they're not looping in legal too early because they want to loop in legal. It's it's just the way sort of these things are done, and there's reasons for that, um, which we're going to talk about. Um, and then same thing on the startup side. Like there's there's this impression that startups, you know, are always moving fast and are, um, you know, trying to push the envelope. And of course, you know, as probably all of you know who are <laughs> watching this. Uh, there's an obvious reason for that. There's a real urgency on the startup side. Uh, so the book was really a uh, really the book that I wish I had when I first started uh, and the first time I was trying to sell into these large companies. So hopefully uh, the presentation today and, and, and the book, if you end up reading it, um, will help you avoid some of the, the mistakes that I made in the early days. Uh, so first of all, like, let's talk about why should we even bother to sell to large companies? I mean, I think in a lot of ways, it's a little, it's much, much easier to sell to a small business, to a mom and pop shop. Um, you can get to the decision maker, you know, same day I can call up a, you know, a mom and pop shop or a single, you know, owner entrepreneur uh, business and walk out that same day with a deal. So why would I bother selling to a large company, which is going to take, you know, six to 12 months to get a deal done, going to have to jump through a bunch of hoops. Well, the rewards are, are, are quite large if you can make these deals happen. So uh, you know, easily to start, they're about 100, they can easily be 100K, many times more than that. Uh, some deals can be over a million, and, and I didn't mention this in the slide, but some deals are even 10 million plus. So if you look at, um, you know, Slack is a good example. Uh, any, any of these like technology companies that sell to large uh, businesses, if you read, you know, their annual reports, or if you look at their, their customer lists that are published because they're, they're publicly traded companies, um, you'll see there's, there's many deals that they have that are, they get paid more than $10 million from a single customer. Um, so there, there's immense value in these enterprise deals if you can make them happen. Um, you know, the other thing is that if you are working on something that's interesting to a large company, there's a good chance that if you do go out of business or you start to run out of money, uh, there's a good chance that the enterprise customer will at least be interested um, in seeing if they can bring that technology or, or, or specifically your team uh, in-house because they really like what you're working on. So um, it's kind of like downside protection in some ways. It's a bit of insurance. And I, I know of several companies that, uh, you know, were working on something very interesting. They got an initial customer or two on the enterprise side, but they couldn't really make the business work as a scalable business. Well, they were acquired and, and uh, you know, were paid nicely to, to join uh, a larger company. So it's a good insurance policy 
And then the upside, of course, is that if, you know, you sell to a company and it's, it's going really, really well, and they say, well, you know, we, we like this so much, we don't want our competitors to have access to it, uh, there's a chance they may want to buy you. So that happens all the time. Um, so there's, there's a real sort of upside uh, opportunity and then a downside protection if you go work with large companies and try to sell to large companies. Of course, it can be a big pain in the butt. Um, there's, there, you know, there's so many challenges, which we will get into, but it's, in my opinion, the rewards are worth it for many entrepreneurs. So there's some common problems that you, you often see in these types of partnerships. So um, startups and, and large companies almost 100% of the time are speaking different languages in terms of uh, the things that matter to them, in terms of the metrics that matter. Uh, and so a lot of times they talk past each other. And, and I think um, in a lot of my work, I kind of play translator, I feel like. Uh, so when I was at, at Estee Lauder, I was one of the few people in the company uh, who had worked in, in sort of the startup world. And so, um, you know, when they'd have these interactions with startups, I a lot of times felt like I was playing translator to try to make them understand uh, what the startup was saying. Uh, another big problem is incentive structures. So in a startup, you uh, basically have nothing to lose, right? Like you, you're coming in with very little revenue. Uh, maybe you have some business, but you're, you're a, an upstart, right? You don't have an existing uh, structure that you're trying to, to protect. Whereas in a large company, you know, some of these companies are $50 billion companies, $20 billion companies, and they've been around for a hundred years, sometimes even longer. Uh, there's a lot to protect. So, so in a lot of times in these companies, they're, they're almost, they're not playing defense, but they are trying to uh, preserve what they have while still trying to grow. And obviously, you know, that creates uh, some, some major differences. Uh, and then finally, the different time horizons, I think, is a, is a major difference, right? And, and it's in the sense, and you guys are all, are all entrepreneurs, so you know, uh, if you come across a problem today, you know, you're, you're not happy if it's not solved in, you know, in a matter of hours, uh, probably by the end of the day today, if, for example, your website isn't working, uh, you're going to want it fixed by, you know, obviously, ideally right now. Uh, you know, corporate doesn't really operate in that same sort of urgency. Uh, you know, if they have an issue, let's say their sales channels are not uh, working the way that, that they used to, and they know they need to, to come up with some new sales channels, like that's going to be a quarterly goal or uh, maybe the next fiscal year goal. So, so these time horizons are, are vastly different um, than, than what a startup is thinking in. And, and a lot of times that causes some issues as well. So I personally believe, um, and this is kind of the theme in, in my book, is that the, the empathy uh, factor is really kind of the key to getting each side to understand each other. And, you know, I think on the startup side, you can go a long, long way uh, if you, if you uh, understand that the corporate partner that you have isn't being slow because, you know, I've heard the phrase dumb dinosaurs thrown around. That's certainly not uh, why they're being slow. There's procedures they have to follow and um, it's not really in their control. And on the other, on the other side, uh, a lot of people in corporate kind of think of entrepreneurs as these real risk takers who, uh, you know, are kind of throwing caution to the wind and, and just going for it. And, and as you guys probably know, like, yes, there is an element of that, but it's, it's calculated and, and you're not um, trying to, to destroy their procedure just for the sake of it. So uh, certainly, you know, not swashbuckling risk taking pirates. And so I, I think if both sides kind of understand each other and look at it as, uh, you know, how can we work together? How can we help solve each other's problems? I think that goes a long, long way to getting these deals done. Um, and, and I think reduces the pain on both sides. Oops. So the, there's this concept called the corporate, uh, the, the innovator's dilemma. And I, I kind of translated that to the corporate innovator's dilemma. Um, a lot of these concepts are actually from a really good author who, who recently passed away, uh, this guy, Clayton Christensen. Uh, from Harvard, and he came up with the innovator's dilemma. Um, so we're going to get into to kind of what that is, but it boils down to what makes a lot what makes it hard for a large company to actually continue to grow and innovate. So that's what we're going to get into right now. So <laughs> I'll give you guys a second to, to look at this cartoon, but I personally really like it. Um, it's why large companies can't do what startups do. Uh, and so, you know, large companies, as you guys have probably seen, a lot of them have innovation groups, a lot of them like to sort of play startup. Um, but you know that the, well, and as sort of this Dilbert cartoon uh, exemplifies, the incentive structures are very different at a startup versus a large company. So even if, 
you know, you are, uh, let's say you have an open office or you, uh, well, in the pre COVID days, you had an open office and you, uh, you know, allowed people to dress casually. That's not the same as, as working in a startup. Um, I think, and it goes back to incentive structures in a startup, you are kind of free to go and, uh, find a new market and to find customers and you're much more empowered. And obviously you're incentivized for those things because if the company grows, whether you're an employee or obviously if you're the founder, if the company grows, that's, you know, you're making your, your compensation on uh, the, the value of the company. Whereas in a large company, like for example, when I was at Estee Lauder, um, you know, none of my compensation was tied to the stock price. So, uh, you know, from my perspective, my performance and the stock performance were totally unrelated things. So whether the company grew or not, you know, maybe, maybe theoretically I cared about it, but it wasn't uh, something that was kind of going through my head every day. Whereas if you're an entrepreneur, everything you're focused on is, is to grow your company and to build your company. Um, so large companies, because of that structural difference can never, and, and sometimes large companies don't like it when I say that, but I strongly believe they can never replicate what uh, startups do. There are ways they can work together with startups uh, to get some of those advantages, but um, I don't think that internally they can ever do uh, anything the way that an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur can do. Uh, and that's why they really need you. And so there's, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of times they feel uh, when they're inter interacting with large companies that they are the ones at the disadvantage and they're trying to sell to the large company. But really the large company needs a startup uh, as much as, as, as you need the large company to grow. So um, there's, it's really a mutual thing here. And so, so it's important to, to understand that and not feel um, that you're at a disadvantage when going into these conversations. So this is, this is an important lesson uh, that took me a long time to learn, uh, even when I was on the startup side. But of course, I, I learned it more when I was on the large company side is this the law of large numbers. So it's hard to wrap your head around just how much money uh, these companies make. So, you know, I gave some examples on the screen uh, that you can see, but you can, you know, Google your favorite, uh, favorite publicly traded company. The revenue numbers are, are massive. Uh, and it, it's very, very hard to move those. And so this is, this is good and bad for entrepreneurs. So if you, you know, taking a step back, looking at how large companies think about their innovation and their own growth, um, and this directly ties to the, you know, what the innovator's dilemma is. Let's take like, Apple, for example. So in 2019, Apple's revenue was $260.2 billion. So each, you know, like $260 billion, if they want to increase their revenue by 1%, they have to increase their revenue by $2.6 billion. So even if you're, let's say Apple, you know, you're working in innovation in Apple or growth in Apple, and you're tasked with starting a new line of business for them, that can grow the company 1%. That means you have to start a company that's going to generate $2.6 billion in revenue. That's really, really, really hard. Uh, and, and it's incredibly difficult to keep growing once you're that big. So it's, I mean, they, they are growing and it's very impressive. Um, and they're doing a lot of that through their existing product lines, which uh, is a whole nother, whole nother presentation. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. Uh, but the, 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 the point is here that um, for them to even grow 1%, they have to, they have to go create uh, a massive, massive new company, basically. Um, and if you think about this from your perspective as an entrepreneur, uh, if you come to a company like Apple and you say, we have an opportunity to uh, grow your revenue by a hundred million, uh, you know, that takes them from 260.2 to 260.3. Like that, that kind of isn't significant. Uh, even though to you and I, right, a hundred million dollars in revenue is, is phenomenal. Uh, and it's, it's an incredible company. And I don't mean to diminish that as an accomplishment at all. Uh, I just mean that when you uh, are approaching a company of the sizes we're talking about here, you have to be very cognizant of the fact that the numbers you feel are big are probably not that big. And so what these, what these companies look at when they evaluate startups is, is that $100 million opportunity, if it was plugged into our company, could it become a $10 billion opportunity? $50 billion opportunity. They're looking at the scale. Um, and, and a lot of times that, that's really what they're looking for. So um, it, it's very, very important to learn this lesson. It took me a long, long time. And I think the flip side to this uh, is that when you are coming up with your pricing, if you're selling to large companies, uh, you know, it's important to remember that, 
again, what's expensive to you if you looked at a contract and somebody was charging you $100,000, to me and you, that might seem very expensive. Uh, to some of these companies, that, that really is, is a drop in the bucket if they feel like they need what you, uh, what you have to offer. Um, so it's important to remember that. I learned that lesson uh, in one of my first uh, sales jobs where I was selling into Procter & Gamble, which is my first enterprise uh, sales experience. And you know, we were, we were selling them something and there was this add-on piece uh, that my boss put $100,000 into the, into the contract as kind of this add-on. And I got very intimidated by that. I said, that's a, that's a lot to charge for this. And, uh, you know, he kind of gave me the lesson that that's a rounding error for who are, you know, the department we were selling into, like they, that is nothing. Uh, and if we, which we truly did have a unique uh, piece of technology to offer them, you know, they didn't even bat an eye at a hundred thousand. So uh, it's just important to remember that, that, you know, these companies, the scale of these companies is, is kind of beyond belief. Um, so it's, yeah, just, just keep that lesson in mind. It takes, it takes a long time to internalize that unless you kind of have sat in the large company and have seen uh, the behemoths that these, these places really are. Uh, so this is a lesson that I think, uh, again, I didn't really understand this till I worked in a large company and I hope uh, you know, I can pass some of those, those lessons on, on here. Uh, so the day-to-day -day life of corporate innovators and kind of people sitting in a corporate environment is very, very different than your day-to-day -day life as an entrepreneur. So for example, like, you know, point number one, for anything to happen in a startup, you have to kind of go make it happen. You have to go email somebody, you have to call somebody, you have to, you know, go build something like nothing sort of happens. Just if you sat in your, sat at your desk or laid in bed, you know, your company, nothing's going to happen in your company. So um, and if you, you don't believe me, just try taking two weeks off as, a, as an early stage entrepreneur and, uh, and, and just don't respond to any emails, don't do anything and then see what happens. Uh, so it's, it's tough as a startup to, uh, for anything to happen without you. On the other hand, on the corporate side, they're getting inbound all the time. I mean, they get contacted by, company, by startups, by consultants, by uh, events. I mean, there's, you know, anybody you can think of is contacting uh, the folks at all the largest companies that you know. Uh, so they're dealing with the opposite problem. They're dealing with how do they sift through all of these different things that are coming through, what's important, uh, what's not important, you know, what can I ignore, uh, and maybe what's, uh, what's worth responding to. So it's important to put your, your mind into that headspace of, the, of they have the opposite problem, of they have too many things coming in. The second thing is, you know, that you're probably not the most important thing on their agenda that day. I mean, you might be if their boss just, you know, yelled at them like, oh, we don't have, uh, you know, an email marketing solution. We really need something. And then you just so happen to be an email marketing company that emails them that same day. Like maybe you are the most important thing on their mind, but 99 times out of 100, uh, you know, you are one of many things that they're, they're, they're dealing with. Uh, just to give you some numbers, like when I was at Estee Lauder, our uh, pipeline of deals at any given time was usually about 200 companies. Uh, and that's active, right? So these are, these are companies that we have some sort of ongoing engagement with, or we're exploring an engagement, not the ones that we ignore. They don't make it on that list of 200. Uh, so you're dealing with, a, you know, the person you're dealing with on the other end has uh, a lot of other things that they are, are looking at. And so um, once again, like if you are the entrepreneur, uh, it's easy to push and push and push and feel like, oh, you know, I talked to them two weeks ago. Why don't we have a deal yet? Um, I talked to them a week ago. Why haven't they responded to my, my latest email? You know, it's just put yourself in their, in their shoes and just remember, you know, they're probably dealing with a lot of other, um, a lot of other projects that are not even on your radar. And then the third thing is kind of related point. Timing is everything in, in, in this. So kind of the example I gave you, your boss yells at you about, uh, you know, an email marketing solution that's missing and, and you just so happen to have an email marketing solution and you contact them you know, deal might get done very, very quickly. Uh, so everything I'm telling you about it taking six months, I mean, that may all be false if, you're, if your timing is perfect. Uh, the only thing is it's really hard to, to, to be perfect like that. So it's important to kind of speak with a lot of companies, be on their radar so that when the timing is right, they immediately think of you as, as kind of the right solution. Um, and then just last, you know, the, the people on the other side, and they really are people, you know, you're not selling, and there's a point later on, but when you sell to Apple, for example, you're not selling to Apple, you're selling to, you know, Tom who works at R&D in Apple, right? So you are dealing with, you are talking to an individual, you're speaking with an individual um, and they have issues that, you know, you as a, as a founder 
don't don't have. Of course, you as a founder, you have different problems that they don't have. But um, you know, you don't have to deal with uh, performance reviews and uh, you know budgeting and I mean, you know you have different types of budgeting as a startup. But you don't have to deal with you know your budget being cut for political reasons. And I mean, there's there's things that happen on the large company side that um, you know trainings and, and such. So uh, just remember as as you're doing these uh, these, these sales conversations that um, your counterpart maybe dealing with with things that that you don't have to deal with so just kind of have that empathy uh, so now incentives incentives are incredibly important to think about when you're selling to large companies and i think it an un, a solid understanding of the incentive structure actually makes you uh not as frustrated as you go through through this process so you as a startup, again, we just talked about this. You are the new thing, right? There's, you're the one kind of coming in and, and you, nobody knows who you are. Uh, the market doesn't know who you are. The companies don't know who you are. So by definition, that is risky, right? There's no reputation there. Um, you know, there's no sort of like, maybe you have a couple case studies, maybe you have a few customers, but you don't have 50 years of background or, you know, you don't have a hundred years or a hundred different projects that you can point to as, as being successful. Um, and that's something you really have to fight against as a startup, because when you're going into these companies, you know, they, these are the same, uh, there, there's a phrase, you know, maybe is uh, dating uh, myself a little bit, but um, there's a phrase called nobody, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And that phrase basically means that if you, you know, you're working at a company, you're evaluating different vendors, I, IBM is one of the vendors, and you pick IBM. Well, that's a safe choice because if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, well, I can tell my boss that, hey, I, bought, I picked IBM and they're the best of the best uh, and it didn't work out. So that means, you know, it's not my fault. We picked the best vendor. That was what was in my control and, uh, and it didn't work. So um, it, it basically comes down to they are not inclined to take a risk and, and working with you is a risk. So you have to kind of figure out how to get around that. Uh, if you put, your, put yourself in the shoes of, of kind of the corporate decision maker, Many times the best case scenario, like let's say they work with you, things go really, really well. They might get a bonus, right? And like that bonus could be 10% extra salary. Great. You know, it's nice. If it doesn't go well and it's too big of a risk, like for example, you have a, you know, a, a payment portal software or something and they decide to switch over to you and it fails terribly on Black Friday or something. Well, that person may lose their job for picking you as the vendor. So there's a big downside risk there. And then the most likely scenario is, uh, you know, and unfortunately everybody who's worked in corporate knows this, is that, you know, you may do all the hard work of finding uh, a startup that can do something really cool. You, you push it through, you get all the implementation done. It goes really, really well. And at the end of the day, your boss takes credit for <laughs> it going so well, even though you did all the work. So the, um, you know, and everybody knows that. So, so this, is a, this is a thing you have to Kind of fight against as in a startup and if you feel that you know your corporate counterpart isn't as excited as you are uh, this is this is kind of like boils down to why and, and and some of the things you have to overcome so now we're going to get into like the fun stuff in my opinion so the actual now those were all the difficult things now we're going to get into like how to actually source and close these deals uh and of course you're never, never going to close 100 percent of them anybody who's worked in sales knows that uh but i think this will hopefully help you out and and uh, lead to closing a higher percentage of these deals. So the first point is a really, really important one. I know I, I alluded to it already, but um, it's the biggest mistake I see uh, is that people feel that, okay, I'm selling to these, you know, these large companies, I'm selling to Apple, I'm selling to Ford, I'm selling to Procter & Gamble, but really you're not selling to those companies. You're selling to people who happen to work at those companies. And those people have goals that they you know, have to accomplish internally they have a budget that they've been assigned, hopefully. Uh, they get a bonus for accomplishing certain goals. And at the end of the day, they, they wanna get home on time. They don't want to have a headache because they worked with you. So those are things that you really have to take into account. And I think, in my opinion, you really have to optimize kind of your sales process, but then also your customer, uh, customer success, customer service process after the sale. Uh, because a lot of times as we'll get into companies don't want to start off with the big sale right away. They want to sort of test it out. Um, just like you would, if you were, you know, buying a software product or, a, or, a, you know, subscribing to a website, you want to do the free trial or you want to do the, you know, one month trial instead of si signing up for the whole year. Companies are the same exact way. 
Um, so I think, you know, there's a real value if you really understand that you're selling to an individual. Uh, you have to optimize your, both the sales process, but then also the, the post-sale process for uh, ease of use, uh, you know, not creating headaches, actually solving problems, not creating problems. Uh, and that's very important to remember. So there's a big important distinction if we're talking about B2B, right? So business to business sales, as opposed to B2C, business to consumer. Um, we're if we're talking B2B, there's a, there's a problem that I, I, as far as I know, has existed since large companies have existed. <laughs> I don't know when that was. Uh, but the, the main issue comes down to the decision maker is not necessarily the end user. Um, and, and, you know, I guess what I mean by that is, let's say you make a software for, uh, you know, cashiers to use at grocery stores that'll make them more efficient or help them in some way. Well, the cashiers are not the ones deciding whether to buy that or not, right? It's, it's their managers. It's the, probably the corporate, somebody up in corporate um, is making that, that decision. They're never going to use the product, right? So the, the concerns that the end user, in that example, the cashier, uh, would have versus the concerns that the decision maker would have might be very, very different. The decision maker might care about the budget. They might care about a reporting tool that tells them, you know, how many times this tool has been used or, uh, you know, if, uh, what transactions were put through the tool. The cashier doesn't care about any of that, right? So the, the, there are, there's differences you have to kind of think about depending on who you're selling and who you're building for. There's a couple ways to get around this. So um, like one, one, probably one of the best examples actually I've ever seen uh, is a tool uh, that HubSpot, if you're familiar with that company, HubSpot released a, a tool, I believe it was back in maybe 2014, 2013 called uh, Signals. And it was a tool that let you see if somebody opened up your email or not. It was just a Chrome extension, like a, a browser extension. And uh, they gave you 200 free opens every month. And really it was used by salespeople. So it was, they gave you 200 uh, free opens every month. And then after that, you had to pay like, you know, $20 a month or something. But let's say, so a lot of people would just pay the 20, like if you were working in sales, you would say, oh, okay, I'll pay for the $20 a month out of my own pocket. This tool is helping me sell. Uh, I, I, I'm just happy to pay for this. Maybe if my company allows me to expense it, great. But once you subscribed, they would send an email saying, okay, introduce us to your boss so you can get a, either a better rate or they were giving gift cards and stuff. So it's kind of like a bottom-up sales process. It was kind of starting from the individual sales people who were the end users, right? They were the people who'd get value and then have those people kind of sell internally, right? So they'd be selling their boss on uh, subscribing kind of corporate-wide uh, to corporate-wide uh, contracts. And um, from everything I've read about that, that went very, very well uh, internally. So that's one way to do it. If you have the ability to work directly with the end user, you can kind of turn the end users into your internal champions. Uh, who will kind of be your internal salespeople, actually. And that, and that works really well. Um, of course, you may still have the, the decision maker have concerns that uh, the end user doesn't have. but So that doesn't solve that problem, but it at least gets you around kind of going the, the, the everybody, the typical way to go is top down. So I find the manager, the director, the vice president, and uh, I want to you know, sell them something that their whole department will use. That's the typical way to do it, but this is the opposite. This is kind of the opposite, and and I think both have value. Um, but for tools that you can target the end user, sometimes it's actually better to go uh, bottom up rather than top down. Um, it doesn't hurt to do both, actually. <laughs> That's probably the best way. So anybody who's interacted with a large company knows uh, that the internal corporate structure can be like a maze. So, you know, you have in theory, right, the org chart, it looks very clean. You have a, you know, executive, executive management and you have the departments and you have the people under that. It looks very organized. Uh, if you ever interacted with these companies, whether to sell to them or you worked internally, you know, uh, it doesn't quite work like that. So you may have multiple departments involved in the decision that interact and, uh, you know, you may have personal relationships that people, somebody doesn't like somebody else and that's why they want to sabotage a deal. So there's a, a very, there's kind of a, I call it the corporate maze, but uh, you know, there's, there's different ways, different things you can call it, but basically it can get very, very confusing. And the only way to really penetrate that and figure out uh, you know, who you need to be talking to, who's the actual decision maker in this process, it's really to have the conversations. So you get into these companies wherever you can, you know, you talk, I gave you the bottom up example, you can go top down also, you know, you talk to the vice president of 
technology or the director of innovation, right? And you start having these conversations, you start learning, um, well, okay, I'm talking to the director of innovation. She's telling me I need to talk to somebody in IT. Okay, great, let's talk to somebody in IT, right? So you really, you, you get into these companies and then you have to basically navigate through the maze and, and that only happens through the conversations. Um, I would suggest starting that as soon as possible because it can be a very long process so if you know, and your product should be ready, right? I mean, don't, don't do this before you have a product or, um, you know, if you feel like your product really is not ready for prime time, but, and we'll get into that. It's actually a separate section here. But um, if you do feel like your product is ready, I would not wait uh, to start these conversations, even if they're just exploratory, uh, you know, and, and with these large companies, most of the time, a no is not really a no. They're just saying no to your current product or to the current stage of, of your company. Um, or to, it could be no for just the reason they don't have any budget right now, or, you know, they're worried about coronavirus and they don't want to spend, but it does get you on their radar. Um, and it's definitely easy to go back. Uh, if you have a change or they have a change, they may reach out to you. So I'd recommend starting these conversations, you know, as soon as you possibly can, uh, because in a best case scenario, they usually take six to 12 months anyway, uh, to kind of go from initial contact to full, uh, scale deal. So there's a few ways you can get in front of these people, um, you know, by far kind of similar to how people think about investors. Uh, warm intro is, is, is best if you can possibly find it. So if you know somebody, you know, LinkedIn is a great tool uh, for something like this. If you see that somebody, you know, knows kind of the relevant person at a company that you're trying to sell into um, asking for an intro, if the person's willing to make that uh, goes a long, long way, uh, you know, a, probably from a success rate standpoint, like a warm intro will at least get you that in, in, initial conversation, maybe 90% of the time, you know, if it's a, it's a personal contact. Um, so it's a, it's a good way to, to kind of get started. Cold email is the most common, I would say. And actually in the book, uh, there's a whole section on kind of uh, ways to go do that and approaches. So I won't, you know, I won't spend a ton of time on that here. That's probably a whole lecture in and of itself, but cold email can also be very effective, but there's a lot of uh, techniques you have to use to kind of, as we, I think we've, uh, one of the earlier slides, we just talked about this where they're receiving tons of inbound every single day and you have to break through that noise. Um, so cold email is, is, is good. And, and I, I recommend it for sure. Social media, I think it's specifically like LinkedIn, but other platforms as well. Uh, if it, if it is not a personal, uh, you know, uh, social media, uh, account, you know, I've seen, horror stories of people saying that, oh, this person reached out to me on Instagram trying to sell me <laughs> their software. Nobody likes that. Uh, but LinkedIn, I think in particular is, is a good, really good one. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to find somebody's email. Uh, some of these companies do make it very difficult to guess the email on purpose because they don't want their employees getting kind of spammed all day. So, um, you know, LinkedIn can be a good, a good way to kind of break through that noise also. Again, you, you got to do it in a genuine way. It can't be spammy. Um, you have to make sure it's relevant. And I think it take, you know, just kind of like a side note, when you're doing sales, it's much, much better to pick, you know, the 10 most relevant potential customers, uh, personalize things for them, talk to, you know, in, even in the cold outreach or a cold email, talk to their specific need um, rather than picking a thousand companies, you know, and just kind of doing the, sp I call it the spray and pray approach uh, where you, people just go and, and kind of copy and paste the same email and send it out, uh, you know, to as many people as they can, you know, that can, that can work. I, you know, I know it has worked actually for people, but uh, in my opinion, it, the success rate is not high and you're just going to waste your time a lot. Uh, the worst thing you can do is message the contact page of a large company or just reach out to like a generic uh, contact page. That said, it has worked before. Uh, there was a example from this past week actually for Pepsi. So some physician uh, in Israel thought of a way to turn their soda stream. So Pepsi owns a company called Soda Stream, uh, which is like an at-home soda making device. And this, this uh, doctor in Israel, he figured out that uh, you can take that device and turn it into a ventilator. And he kind of did it on his own. So he sort of hacked together a, a soda stream, turned it into a ventilator and was like, wow, this actually has a lot of potential. So he didn't know anybody at Pepsi, which owns soda stream. And he just left a, a voicemail on their customer service line. And somehow that got up to the head of R&D. And uh, I think this is three months ago. And now three months later, they have a clinical trial going on 
for the soda stream device to be turned into a ventilator, like a, a very cheap ventilator. You know, they normally cost like fifty thousand dollars. I think this is sub a thousand dollars. So it's a, you know, that I say it's the worst is messaging the contact page or just leaving a message at the, the customer service. It can work. You know, all these all these methods are just uh, they're all tools um, to kind of keep in your toolbox and. Uh, you know, try all of them. There's certainly examples like the one I just gave you where it's, it's very successful to message a generic, uh, a generic contact page. Uh, so this, this stage can be, you know, when I say six to 12 months to close a deal, this stage is probably the longest. Uh, let's say you get in the door. So somebody responds to your email and says, oh, you know, there's, there, your company sounds very interesting. I'd love to chat. Uh, and then gives you some times. Many, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, times those um, intro calls can be can take a while to schedule because they're going to want to have many people on the call. Uh, you know, and again, going back to that corporate org chart that we talked about, they want uh, let's say it's a technology product just because that's what I, I kind of know best. Um, you know, they may have the head of IT on the phone, or they may have a, a digital marketing person on the phone, or they may have you know every every kind of department that gets touched by your uh, your technology or your uh, your product, they're going to want to loop in at least somebody from that department. They might, they're probably not all decision makers, but this is kind of more of like a political thing internal, like inside of these companies. They want to, uh, you know, kind of make sure they have buy-in from everybody affected. All, you know, I call them stakeholders. Uh, everybody who's a stakeholder in that decision, they kind of usually want to have them uh, involved. Sometimes they won't do that on the intro call. Many, you know, sometimes they'll say, okay, I'll just do the intro call. They'll, you know, they'll take some notes when you, when you share your product, you might share a demo, uh, and then they'll share those notes with the relevant stakeholders and the follow-up calls will be with the stakeholders. Sometimes these calls, I mean, there can be seven calls, 10 calls. It doesn't mean you're going to get a deal. Uh, it is a good sign because it means they are somewhat interested at least, uh, but it, it certainly doesn't mean that, that there's a deal coming. Uh, so just be prepared for having a lot of these calls, understanding what it is they're trying to solve for. So uh, a lot of times they're solving for, there might be one particular concern uh, that they wanna hear you know, an answer from you, or it might be they truly don't understand the product, or it could be they're trying to find the right place for it to fit. Uh, and then finally, and this is, and I think this is the most common, they're actually looking for what's the right pilot project to do, which we're gonna get into in a second. Uh, but they're looking for, if we wanted to test this out, where is the right place inside of our company to test this out? Because yes, you might approach them with an idea, you know, let's say like a chatbot tool that could be used in all of their departments and it sounds great, but that's never gonna happen right out of the gate. They're never gonna say, well, we're gonna implement this globally uh, into, you know, into, our, into our websites across the world uh, because that's, that's just too much risk. They don't know who you are. Uh, so they wanna test it out. They may say, let's test this, test this out on our, uh, you know, on our French website, or let's test this out in, in the app we have for uh, Japan, you know, they, they may, they, they're going to pick like some very small example to try to get some data or some information and also to get a sense of what it's like to work with you. Uh, so they, you know, the pilot projects have value on, on many fronts, but these follow-up calls a lot of times are, are to figure that out, uh, to really kind of figure out where's the right place for this uh, and, and to work together. Negotiation can take a long time. And this is where, uh, you know, let's say you do have a, a stakeholder internally who says, great, you know, we want to pilot this uh, in our customer service center, for example. And, uh, you know, now I need to loop in my legal department and my accounting department, and I need to figure out kind of, uh, we need to figure out a contract. And specific, usually that'll just be legal. Accounting will come later, uh, but legal will come in. And legal can take, it can take a long time. And there can be a lot of problems. Uh, you know, there are, there are probably countless examples of companies getting to the stage where they have the stakeholder buy-in. So the, the decision maker says, you know, great, I want to do this. Here's my budget. Here's my timeline. I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm looping in John and legal. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to hearing about next steps. Well, legal has to sign off on it. And this is the issue in many companies. Legal is not, in, going back to the corporate incentives, they're not incentivized for innovation, right? They're incentivized to avoid lawsuits. They're incentivized to avoid problems. And, you know, that can cause a lot of issues for you as a startup. So what I actually recommend is earlier on in the process, seeing if you can get legal on one of those follow-up calls so that you can get ahead of any concerns. Because it, what really sucks is when you get 
this far, you go, you know, you go to the point of, you know, you have the stakeholder buy-in, the budget, you start thinking in your head, like how you're going to spend the revenue. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay, I need to hire this designer or I need to start recruiting this engineer, right? And you may still be six months from a deal uh, when you get into that first conversation with legal because there's many things that, you know, you as the startup and the stakeholder would have never talked about. Little things even like, you know, who has the rights to the data where, you know, where that data lives, let's say if it's a technology product. Uh, you know, there's negotiation many times on, can you use their logo on your, on your website and list them as a customer? Uh, you know, some companies really don't like being listed as a customer at, on startup websites. Uh, and there's, you know, there's reasons for that. Uh, they, and maybe they got burned in the past or uh, they're trying to mitigate against something, but uh, you know, it can get very minute uh, and it can be, it can be very annoying. And like you, let's say you're working with a lawyer your lawyer may present them an agreement. They may say, well, we don't use outside agreements. You have to use our agreement. And your lawyer may look at that and say, well, they're screwing you over with this term here. Uh, and this can go back and forth for a long time. So this is why I actually recommend uh, looping in, trying to get their league, you know, the, the large company's legal group involved as soon as you start feeling like there's a pilot coming uh, or it's like kind of getting close to that, you should ask your stakeholder that, you know, I'd love to connect uh, my lawyer with, uh, your corporate legal so we can start uh, working through the contract specifics uh, just to kind of speed up that timeline a little bit. You might get lucky. I mean, we had at Estee Lauder, there was one, uh, one of the lawyers in the legal group who we, we worked with a lot. You know, she wasn't incentivized for innovation, but I have to say she uh, did an amazing job accelerating innovation and kind of, you know, making sure the company was protected, but trying to go as fast as she could and not getting uh, kind of bogged down in, in some of these details. So I think you know, I think sometimes you also can get lucky with the right uh, corporate counterpart in the legal department. So pilot projects, which uh, I've spoken about a little bit already, but, um, you know, companies are always, almost always going to start with a pilot project. They're not going to say, uh, you know, we want to do this globally, especially if it's a large company, as we talked about, a lot of risks. They want to start slow. They want to see how it is, not just your technology and how their customers respond to it, but they also want to see how you operate. You know, are you good at customer service? Like if there's problems with the product, do you, do you take a week to respond or you respond right away? Uh, does your product keep improving over time, right? They, if you're a customer, especially technology product, it doesn't, shouldn't stay the same. It should keep improving. Um, if they find a bug, how quickly do you fix it? So there's, there's things they're watching for. Uh, you should 100% be getting paid for any pilot projects. Uh, companies a lot of times try to do unpaid pilots that is, uh, it, it does, it, it's them trying to pull a fast one. If anybody tries to do a free pilot project, you should definitely be getting paid for any implementation that you do with a large company um, and you should insist on it. And, and, and they, they know that. Uh, and then finally, I would highly, highly, highly recommend setting up some success metrics ahead of time. And like, what I mean by that is, let's say you have, um, actually this is a real, like, real life example. Uh, there is a company I know that does uh, interactive emails. So like the email that you receive, it changes the content internal in, inside of that changes based on context. So based on data they have about you. And um, it's basically, you know, for, for companies that sell through email or who do, um, you know, clothing brands or beauty brands or things like that. So um, if he was selling into a large company and this happened, you know, if he sets success metrics, so, so as the salesperson or the founder, he says, well, if you get you know this many clicks, like this this type of interaction on the email, uh, this conversion rate, right? Setting those metrics up ahead of time will go a long way because what may happen is, and what you don't want to have happen, uh, is let's say you don't set these success metrics up ahead of time, and you know his he sends out they do a pilot project, they send out the email, ten percent of the people click, five percent of them buy, you know, and it's phenomenal numbers but it's phenomenal by whose standards, right? It might be phenomenal by industry standards, but if your counterpart is just looking for a reason to say no, they'll say, oh, well, we really wanted a 10% buy rate or we wanted a 20% click rate and you only got 10%. So you need to set those up ahead of time. Like if you set up, okay, we want 7% click rate uh, and that's how we're gonna go into the pilot. If we exceed 7%, then it's a successful pilot. If it's below 7%, then you know we tried, it was a good project and uh, you know, we'll see if, you know, we can do another pilot after we improve our product, but having those metrics set up ahead of time will stop you from getting, uh, you know, frankly screwed by a company, you know, a corporate decision maker 
kind of moving the goalposts on you midway through the project. So you really want to set these up ahead of time. Uh, finally, if the, if the project goes well, the pilot project goes well, you know, you're going to encounter uh, the situation where you want to expand this out. So let's use the email example uh, once again. So, you know, they do the pilot, it goes well. Now you're trying to figure out like, okay, how does this become a regular part of their email marketing? So you may have charged, you know, $1,000 for the pilot or, you know, whatever the amount was for the pilot. Typically, if it's software, the price will come down if it becomes a regular uh, project, right? Or if it becomes a regular contract. Uh, you know, an easy example is like, let's say it's a, something that like every user in the company, uh, so every employee in the company can use. So let's say when you did the pilot, it was 100, 100 users, $10 per user, right? So it's a $1,000 pilot. Cool. But now you want to scale this out and there's 20,000 employees. It'll be hard to get them to pay the $10 per user per month, but they'll probably be willing to pay like five, six. Like they want a discount. They're, usually they're going to try to get a discount. Sometimes you can get away with not getting the discount. I mean, don't offer the discount necessarily unless you have to. Uh, but just know that a lot of companies do expect volume discounts when you start doing scale up um, across. And, and it makes sense if you look at it. I mean, if they're bringing you 50,000 customers versus... 50 customers, right? It, it makes a difference. Uh, but this part is a little easier if you had set the pilot success metrics up ahead of time, because then you don't have to haggle over like, was the pilot successful or not? It's not a matter of opinion. Um, it's a very objective, uh, objective metric based thing. And you can even have some of these scale up conversations before the pilot, right? So you can say, well, the pilot makes sense to do for this particular department. Uh, but if that goes well, you know, these three departments are good next steps. So, you know, the next steps can also be hashed out in the negotiating phase. Now there's common mistakes that, that people make in this process. So one, um, which we started talking about earlier is that, uh, you know, large companies, yes, they're very big and they make a lot of money and, you know, they, they maybe have a lot of cash, but it's not limitless. And the person that you're talking to uh, does not have a limitless budget that I can assure you. So the, you know, the corporate uh, counterpart that you have, maybe their budget is $3 million for, for new technology. Well, you're probably just one of many tools that they are going to need to subscribe to that year or that they're looking at. And so their budget is not limitless. So, you know, some people don't charge enough. I've also seen the opposite thing where companies assume, startups assume that, uh, well, I'm selling to a large company, so they must, you know, I can charge them anything I want it doesn't quite work like that. And they also know that, you know, they know where the benchmarks are of, of what other companies are charging. Um, the second thing is trivializing corporate knowledge. So, uh, you know, a lot of times people in large companies, I mean, they might've been doing the exact same thing for 25 years, 30 years, and they've built a very deep knowledge about that industry and about, you know, their company's particular uh, place in that. And as startup founders, a lot of times we're working on where the future is going and where the industry is going. And a lot of times that's a matter of opinion, right? Like we, none of us saw COVID coming, like for example, uh, none of us knew like, okay, the future of the travel industry is in doubt, right? Last year, if somebody, you told somebody that they would have thought you're, you know, you're crazy. <clears throat> but on the other hand, these people who worked in large companies, maybe they've had an outbreak of something in some other country that they operate in. So they say, oh, we were operating in, you know, Vietnam or something. And there was a uh, uh, an outbreak there. And we know that flights can be grounded. They maybe had some, con you know, maybe not contingency plans, but it was part of their sort of knowledge base that this could happen. So just using that as an example of there are uh, people who've worked on one problem, let's say for 30 years. So they have a deep knowledge that you as a startup founder might not have. So there's actually a lot you can learn uh, in these, in these interactions with corporate, uh, cor corporate uh, influencers. So the, um, so these sales conversations can kind of go both ways and you can use that as you kind of build up your, uh, your knowledge base as an entrepreneur. Uh, this one, the third one, uh, using too much startup jargon is uh, something I learned firsthand when I was working at, uh, at Estee Lauder. My first couple of weeks there, uh, I was talking to a, uh, I think he's like VP of R&D or something. And I mentioned a startup that I knew that was coming out of an accelerator. So I kept using this term accelerator, accelerator. And we all know what that is, obviously, you know, sitting here on the, on the, the startup side. He had never heard of an accelerator. He thought I was talking about particle accelerators that they use in physics uh, for scientific research. So he was very confused about what I was saying when I was kept using the word accelerator. Uh, and that was to me just like firsthand, like not everybody sits in this world of, you know, startups and, 
accelerators and VCs and uh, bootstrapping. And, you know, this, it's not the world many, of, many other people live in, especially in large companies, you know, unless somebody's sitting on a, a corporate venture capital team or an innovation team, they might not know uh, any of those terms. So just try to avoid the jargon if you can. And then finally, the implementation costs are a very important part of the kind of scale up. So an example that I like to give um, is around like, let's say you're doing something about the point of sale uh, station, let's say for, for what a large company uses. Your software or your hardware might be fairly inexpensive. Uh, and you might think, well, I'm only charging them, you know, $50 per month per location or something. And they have a thousand locations. So it's not that bad. But what you're not thinking about is like the cost of physically going and swapping out their old hardware, swapping out their old software, training all the employees on the new system. Like these are other costs that maybe they're not paying you for these things, but they are costs for the company. So it's important to remember that. Um, and if you can, you know, maybe optimize your, your product or your uh, even your process for minimizing those implementation costs. But uh, just that's not something to ignore. And I've written about this uh, in a bit deeper uh, format on my website and you can, you can see the URL there. So this is another one that uh, I've seen happen way too much. This is actually the problem of going in too early. Uh, so if you are, let's say your product is uh, new or you've never had a customer before and you have the good fortune of selling to a large company and they bite and they say, yes, we want to become your customer. You close the deal and your first customer is Home Depot or some large company like that. That sounds great. You know, you got a big contract, you know, everything is good, but there's a flip side to it. Any large company is going to have very specific requests. They're going to have requests for features. They're going to have requests for data security. They're going to have requests for integration with the stuff that they already do. They're going to have requests around reporting. They're going to want one-on-one -on -one service. They're going to want weekly calls, monthly calls, all of this stuff. All of that makes it very, very hard to continue growing your business if that's your first and only customer because you don't want to lose that customer, right? So you just went from $0 in revenue to let's say $50,000 in revenue uh, per month. And you really don't want to lose that because that's what's keeping your, your business open. Uh, and so it's very easy to get stuck in this trap of basically becoming a corporate dev shop that you're basically building for one customer. Uh, and that's a, it's a trap. It's a, it's a real trap. You can get out of it uh, if you're very, very disciplined and you set the expectations with that customer. But if they get used to, you know, anytime they request a feature, you go build it right away. Or, you know, anytime they request a call, you take the call and, you know, these calls are not around bugs or around problems, but they're just brainstorm calls or strategy sessions. I mean, their companies will take whatever they can get um, from this standpoint. So you just have to be very disciplined if you happen to fall into that trap. A lot of times the, the better way to do it is kind of test your process and build your company with a few small customers first um, or smaller customers if possible and kind of build out the process and have a few other uh, clients before closing with a big company. Most of the time that's how it's done. But I have seen a few times where a company kind of has the good fortune of uh, closing a large company early on, but then get kind of gets stuck in this loop of, of having just one customer. And, you know, you can stay alive for, for a long time like that. Like you can, your company won't close, but you didn't, you didn't start your company to become a one customer shop. Uh, that's a, that you might as well be an employee at that point. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. And, and as you go kind of figure out your own sales strategy of who to go sell to, when to approach large companies, just kind of keep that in mind and, and know that, um, this is a trap that that you know previous companies have fallen into. Uh, we're nearing the end now, but the exclusivity clause is something that um, companies can very much fall for. Uh, large companies a lot of times will make this request. They will say, you know, well, you know, we don't want you using uh, this tech or selling this technology to a competitor uh, if you work with us. So, you know, going back to legal. This is something the legal department very often will try to sneak in and they'll say, um, well, you have to sign this exclusivity clause. You can't sell to any other. Some companies will say you can't sell to any other companies. Those typically are the you know, bigger, more diversified companies. You know, I could imagine an Amazon saying that, uh, Procter & Gamble saying that because they're involved in many fields. They're involved in healthcare, e-commerce, you know, uh, retail, like all these different industries. So they may say across the board, you work with us, you can't work with any other large company. My response to anything like that is always, well, if you really want exclusivity on it, you can buy the company, right? There's, you know, you're not, um, nobody's going to take exclusive. You shouldn't let anybody, I can't say nobody will. 
you shouldn't take exclusivity uh, for a regular customer contract. You know, if they do want that, you should just insist. Like, it sounds like you think this has a lot of potential. Uh, maybe this is an acquisition conversation rather than a customer conversation, right? And I think you'll find out very quickly whether they were just trying to pull a fast one or whether they were serious about that. Because maybe it does elevate to the to the um, acquisitions team and, and it, it does become that type of conversation. Uh, but most cases, like I would say 99 times out of 100, they were just trying to pull, you know, just trying to include that as standard. And uh, it's certainly not standard. The other thing is that companies in specialized areas may say, well, you know, we don't want you to sell to one of our competitors, you know, or in our industry. And that is a little bit more common. Uh, and it is acceptable to, to say yes to that as long as you're getting paid for it, like paid extra. Uh, so like, for example, at Estee Lauder, like Estee Lauder just does beauty, right? They don't do any other stuff. So they didn't care about global exclusivity, you know, any industry. They just cared that they got beauty exclusivity, exclusivity or cosmetics ex exclusivity. I, I think that's, that's a little bit better for you as an entrepreneur. If you, if you are, you know, you have multiple verticals you can sell to. Um, if, you know, a company is willing to pay you triple the price for exclusivity for their industry, maybe it's worth it. Uh, you know, you get triple the revenue for off of one customer. Maybe it's not worth it. You know, that's, it, that's kind of a case by case uh, decision, but that is le less, um, uh, less of like a pseudo acquisition if it's just industry exclusivity. Uh, and then the last thing related to this is that you should always put a timeline on any kind of exclusive agreement. Again, if they want to be exclusive forever, uh, like no end to the exclusivity, then they can buy the company. Uh, you know, otherwise you can say, well, it's exclusive for two years or for one year. And after that, we can go sell to other people um, or we can review it, right? If you want to renew the exclusivity after a year, like this is, you know, we'll, we'll renegotiate that, but don't sign something where it's like, you know, well, we'll pay you a hundred thousand dollars now. Sounds great. Uh, but then you can never sell to any competitor. And by the way, we're going to not renew your contract next year, but you're still tied to, under this exclusivity clause. So just be very careful with any time somebody mentions this and kind of default to no, you don't want to sell it exclusively unless they pay you significantly for it. Uh, and uh, this is just a, you know, a couple of little tips and tricks here, but uh, you know, the most companies, especially in the software space default to monthly plans. Uh, a lot of times in large companies, the annual plan actually is, makes more sense to the decision maker, like just, you know, for example, if somebody has a, a $500,000 budget for software products, your, your product, you're charging $10,000 a month for them to, to use it. Uh, so it's 12, you know, 120,000, but paid out over 12 months, or you can charge them hundred thousand dollars today, for example, and uh, they'll get it for the whole year. That's great for you as an entrepreneur, because you just brought hundred thousand dollars into the company. That's like an investment. Right. That's like, you know, if you go to an investor and they wrote you a check for a hundred thousand, you know, that's, that would feel good, except now you're not giving up any equity. It's a hundred thousand dollars from a customer. Uh, so it's even better. You can kind of promote the annual plan over the monthly plan because as, as a large company, I'm not as a large company decision maker, I'm not budgeted monthly, right? I'm budgeted on a quarterly or an annual basis. Uh, so charging me monthly actually doesn't help. Like I don't care if it's monthly. Maybe charging me quarterly helps. Charging annual is, you know, pretty typical. And they will probably say yes to the annual plan for a discount because it, it kind of is a win-win for both sides. And I think for the entrepreneur, for you as the founder, it's, it is better to bring that revenue up forward uh, so that you can, even if it's a little bit less, uh, so that you can go continue to use that money to grow. And then last but not least, like this goes back to that example I gave uh, <clears throat> when I was selling into Procter & Gamble but there's add-ons that you can create like onboarding, training, um, you know, things like that, that are, you know, sometimes even consulting, depending on what you're doing, uh, that large companies will happily pay for because it enhances the value of what you're doing uh, and, you know, what they're getting from you for a, for them, negligible additional fee. Like, if, you know, again, going back to the hundred thousand dollars for 12 months, if that's the software cost, and then you charge, you know, an extra 3000 for onboarding and, you know, 2000 for monthly strategy sessions with that, with their team or something, you know, it's not that much of a, of an increase, but it might make your product a lot more effective and make them, uh, you know, more excited about using it because now you're going to hold their hand through the process and they feel like they're really getting, 
uh, you know, personalized and, and high touch experience. So there's, there's ways to do that, that are going to drive more revenue to you in a way that doesn't make it feel like to the, to the partner that you're kind of nickel and diming them. So back office, we did talk about a lot of this already, but accounting is the other group that you kind of have to be uh, watching out for. And again, I think it helps a lot if you know this going in and you can ask all the right questions. Like for example, when you're you know, working on the contract or just ask the question, what's the process for, um, you know, for your accounts payable? Like what, you know, or what's the process to be an approved vendor? Um, and sometimes, you know, it's an easy process. Sometimes it can take a lot longer. Uh, you know, it also depends what you're doing. So like some companies, they want to understand the data security. Some companies, they want to uh, understand uh, where the company, if the company is not, uh, or if it's producing a physical product, they want to understand like where it's being produced. Is everything licensed properly? Uh, you know, they want to, they want to kind of cover their butt. So again, talking about that upfront is a lot better than getting surprised by that and then adding six months to your process, for example. Uh, so just kind of take charge when you're, when you're interacting with this. So that's a, kind of a quick overview. Um, I hope we're not like over time or anything, but uh, that's a quick overview of a lot of the information that's in the book. And, you know, I hope you'll go read it. Uh, it's a lot deeper in there, uh, but you can also find more information on my website. Feel free to email me if you have any questions. Uh, I have my email on there and you can also find that at the website. I'm also active on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. So those are, are the URLs there and um, you feel free to reach out. And then last but not least, I, um, so I'm working on this at the moment. Uh, I'm turning the book content into a deeper course that actually gets into uh, more detail, but also brings in other people. So, you know, corporate innovators from like top companies, you know, Under Armour is gonna be involved, Estee Lauder involved, um, you know, I know I have folks at other companies who want to, to kind of give like guest lectures. So you can really get a sense for from their own words, not mine, uh, what these companies care about, you know, what's the process, what are the types of companies they look for, <clears throat> and then also kind of go deeper into some of the content we talked about today. So I want to show you, you know, the spreadsheets uh, that companies are using to, to track this stuff, the CRMs, uh, the types of cold emails that work, the types of cold emails that don't work. Uh, and really kind of get into maybe contracts, you know, a lot of detail here. And then on top of that, I want to build a community um, that will be of fellow founders. So people like you, uh, you know, and me, as well as corporate innovators and kind of bring people together. So kind of going back to my initial empathy com um, uh, comment earlier at the beginning of the presentation, I think building a uh, community and having like-minded people around uh, from both sides of the table will kind of in increase empathy for for both sides. I think people will get to know each other. There, there are actually a lot better ways of working together than it's done today. I don't think cold email to a busy corporate innovator is the ideal way, but it's right now the most common way. Uh, so I'm hoping to improve that through the community. And you can uh, see the URL on the screen. It's just neilsony.com slash course. Um, and I just have like a little form there that you can fill out. There's no you know, obligation at this point but, because it's not launched yet. Uh, but this is just a way to kind of like express your interest and um, of course, anybody who signs up there will uh, will get a discount. Awesome. So yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's the end. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, there are a ton of questions for you. Oh, awesome. I'm kind of uh, trying to figure out where to start. So I think uh, one of the more common questions that that we get is, I'm I'm afraid of getting my intellectual property stolen. If I work with larger companies, I don't have a legal team that can match theirs. Yep. What what advice do you have for entrepreneurs who who have that as a concern, and how valid is it? Do larger companies indeed steal startups' intellectual property, or, or is that more of a? a well, it depends what we're talking about with intellectual property. So. It does happen. I mean, the, the very recent example was uh, Amazon got caught doing that. Uh, I think it was a few weeks ago that they were looking at, you know, which products were selling well on uh, the website and, and, and kind of copying that. So it, it does happen. Um, it's less common than you would think. It's less common than you would think for all the reasons that we talked about in the, you know, in the presentation that, uh, you know, let's say you have a, an interesting, you know, new way of selling something. I don't know, just making it up. 
uh, so I'm assuming it's not like a scientific intellectual property, right? If it is, if it's like a, a drug or an invention or something like that, um, I would definitely recommend talking to a lawyer and, and working with a lawyer. You can find lawyers like for things like that, you can find lawyers who might do it for equity. Uh, like there are, you know, for, for physical inventions, there are, are ways of getting around having to pay an arm and a leg up front. Uh, if you're talking like intellectual property, like a process, like something that can easily kind of be copied. Uh, well, there's kind of two things. One, try not to give your secret sauce if you can uh, in these conversations, you know, try to kind of hide it as much as possible while still kind of making them intrigued. But on the other hand, um, a lot of times you don't have to be that worried about it. You know, I, I was trying to find examples of this a few months ago because I'd gotten this very similar question. Uh, I couldn't really find too many examples of this actually being done successfully, right? Like I know Facebook tried to copy Snapchat in the early days and like that did not work at all. Like Snapchat is still a great, you know, a good company and that feature that Facebook launched, I guess they have, they still have the stories feature, but it's not, um, you know, we don't think of Facebook for that, right? Like, and, and it didn't kill Snap. So there are, and this is like, they, they tried to copy it way early too. And they, they told them we're gonna copy it. And, you know, so there's, there's a lot of examples of companies trying, but successfully copying is, it's rare. Um, and it goes back to the reasons we talked about, like who internally is going to lead that process, right? And what are they getting in exchange for doing that? Like if I'm, you know, if I'm an employee at Procter & Gamble and you come to me with a cool toothpaste idea, that's like the next generation of toothpaste and it's more environmentally friendly or whatever. Uh, okay, like, do I get a, you know, what do I get to cop? Like, what, am, what is in it for me to personally to steal that idea and build it out at Procter & Gamble, right? Like, it's, it's, it sounds more likely than it actually is, right? It sounds like, well, okay, Procter & Gamble is gonna steal my idea. The famous thing venture capitalists say is uh, Google is going, you know, what happens if Google tries to do this and like, you know, Google tried to do a social network too, but it didn't work. Like Google plus didn't work. Was, like big companies can steal stuff, but they very, it's very unlikely they're going to successfully steal it. Right. So I was trying to look for examples that it was stolen and it worked, right? Like it, it became very popular. Many times they might try to, maybe they'll try to steal it. Maybe they won't, but they are not necessarily going to be able to be successful. Actually, most likely I'd say they wouldn't be successful. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think of big, uh, big ideas and execution like cars, right? You might steal a car, but if you don't know how to drive it, yeah, <laughs> good luck. That's a great right? point. It's a great point, yep. Awesome, so we also have a question um, that ex highlights the difference between software and product, right? So okay. for a software company selling 100 versus 1,000 units, it's pretty similar, but when you're right. selling products, the price vary as the amounts go up, right? Yep. Um, wholesale price, large companies require makes it very difficult to produce. I'm trying to sell my products to Procter & Gamble, but I don't have the production capacity they require. What do you recommend? And is the, well, if the production capacity problem is, um, and I don't know if this person, there's probably a lot of specifics, but um, yeah. if they're producing themselves versus using a contract manufacturer, or if it's a cash problem or like a physical manufacturing facility problem, if it's, it's a, cash a cash problem, problem. it's a cash problem in the background. Yes. Yeah. So, so the cash problem, if you have a order or like an indication of an order, it's uh, becoming like, that is a problem. A lot of people have recognized and there are, I can think of one off the top of my head, uh, but I'm sure they have competitors. So I'm sure there's others uh, who offer loans to companies specifically for that. Like they like, okay, you have a large company interested. Their wholesale requirement is uh you know, higher than what you can currently afford to produce. So uh, we will give you a loan to be able to bridge that gap. And then you basically pay us a small cut of the, of the project, um, you know, or of the amount you're going to make off of that. So there's, they specifically were started for that problem. You know, I think it's, so it, up to now it has been very difficult and um, you know, working at Estee Lauder, like that was a big complaint like that, uh, that entrepreneurs would bring up. They would say, you know, if we work together, like you have these, all these requirements, you, you need this many units. We can't, like, I can't afford to pay for that uh, out of pocket. So there's, mm -hmm. there are companies, you know, I've been out of that space for like a, a couple of years now. So I, I'm sure it has evolved much more, but there are, there were people working on that specific problem. Um, and I can think of one off the top of my head. I can send it to you after, and you can maybe forward it to this person. Please, please. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you know if there's companies that are willing to put up 
the upfront capital or are there any uh, pipeline programs companies are implementing to solve this for the startups they're working with or to solve this like with? the corporates themselves yes uh yeah i think so i think a lot of the corporate venture capital groups uh do that so like <clears throat> Like I think Procter and Gamble actually has I I don't know if they still do but they they definitely did at least recent until recently um, a group where they actually would invest in different brands and uh, assist with the supply chain side also so I knew because the supply chain side is is difficult for a lot of companies um, especially on the startup uh, front and actually uh, I can think of a better example in Procter and Gamble uh, Anheuser Busch has their group ZX Ventures uh, and so they they invest they have an accelerator. Uh, and they, that's something they help with too. So if you have like a beverage brand, for example, and you're trying to, uh, and, and you get investment from them, they do help you kind of scale up uh, the production and, you know, figure out where you're going to source your cans from or your bottles or whatever your, you know, package of choices. Uh, and then, you know, scale up the recipe, source the ingredients. Like that's something they bring to the table. So right. I think you're right. Like, I think it, it is actually a big opportunity for large companies to kind of show a difference, right? Or like, or, um, provide extra value to the startups they get involved with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, pause for one second. I'm just going to turn on the light. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, so in the meantime, I want to remind you that you guys can send your questions to the Street Entrepreneurs Facebook Messenger. Um, and if you are in the Street Entrepreneurs Accelerator program, regardless of the cohort, you can text me. So I can see your questions first. Um, so I I do have a a question that kind of intrigued me. Have you have you seen startups who end up losing money? Um, losing money in what sense? Like when they general? sell to larger companies because the the wholesale price mm. that you require is smaller or not smaller, but. Um. No, I haven't seen that uh, personally, but you know, so basically you're saying they like sell for less than what it costs them yep. in order to get in the door. Yeah. Cause they're allured by, oh, but I'm going to sell X many units and they actually, they actually do the math. They actually end up losing money. I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah, of course. But, uh, um... <laughs> but I, I, so I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it, but I am sure it's happened. Uh, it certainly would not surprise me if that's happened. So uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it though. Yeah, like, yeah, of course. Especially do in the world numbers. we live in. Well, it, do your numbers, but also in the yeah. world that we live in right now, um, the everything is so accessible, right? Like you can yeah. put up a Shopify store, or like you can you can sell directly to consumer and really prove out the value of the product before yeah. you even approach a large company. So to the point where you are as much as possible, if you can kind of make yourself a um, you know a wanted item or like a hot commodity before you have those conversations, it helps, right? If you're like, it, it's the difference between kind of like them having to sell to you, like why they are the right partner, as opposed to you kind of desperately trying to sell to them. Uh, you know, it never, like it's, whether you're selling to a large company or anybody, it, desperation is never good. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, I think as much as you can, like if you can prove the demand, you can prove like, oh, people are willing to pay this price. Uh, that'll go over a little better than, uh, well, especially for you. I'm, I'm sure the company, the large company would want to take it at a discount, but uh, for the entrepreneur, I think it's much better. Do your numbers, you know, don't lose money selling products for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I can see a lot of companies, um, I, I've actually heard, so when, when entrepreneurs try and sell to Walmart, Walmart will require a certain unit economics that requires them to lower the quality of their mm. product or to really cut costs to to an extent where their the margin on the on the per product is, is tiny right but the companies are lured in because they say oh well but i'm going to sell this many right and they actually end up doing more work uh for a lesser margin than if they had stayed selling directly to consumer um and yeah it just was interested to get your, your take on that a little bit yeah i think that i mean it's such a case-by-case -case thing but i think yeah. that like in general the example that you gave like it's it's definitely you don't want to compromise uh too much on the quality of your product but it is a it is a case-by-case -case thing like maybe you know you are selling something that needs 
a million units or 10 million units for it to really make sense versus yeah. selling yeah. direct to consumer. You can only sell less than that. So yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to give like blanket advice in something in a case like that, but I just like in general, don't lose money <laughs> while you're selling a product. Yeah, That's yeah, like some general advice. Of course. What, what would you say is a healthy margin? Oh, it depends on the industry on a, for sure. A, but on a beauty product, say a face cream well, if it's a luxury it's product there and i know they're watching so yeah well if it's a luxury <laughs> product you should try to do like a 75 percent gross margin which sounds crazy but like you mm -hmm. know you sell the product for 12 dollars, cost you three like that's that's like at a minimum um estee lauder i know it was 85 90 percent in a lot of cases and, and not just estee lauder but like most of the large beauty companies but then they spend a ridiculous amount on marketing so like the final margin comes down to like 15, 20%. Um, know, packaging. I heard packaging. Yeah, packaging is many times packaging is more expensive than the product. Yeah. 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 That's they great. have a brand, Estee Lauder has a brand called Le Mer. Uh, it's like a $200 mm -hmm. face cream, very expensive brand. The, if I remember the numbers correctly, the package was like $30 or something wow. of that $200. It's a, it's like a hefty, you know, it's like feels, they wanted to feel super luxury. So, um, but yeah. the package was very expensive. I don't even remember how much the cream cost, but it was less than 30. <laughs> I always just think about the waste, right? The waste that goes into these products and creating fancy packaging that, you know? Yeah. I, you know, so I know some companies were talking about, I don't know if they ended up doing it, but like uh, reusable packaging. Yes. And I don't it. know if it, if it ever got popular, but I saw, I remember seeing some things about that like a year or two ago. I have seen some reusable, um, dish soaps you can order a capsule water yeah um which i think is very interesting yeah i'd love to see something where i can just send all of my core products to be refilled and that would be like a win-win right because you don't need to pay for the packaging either as yeah. a company so yeah and also reducing the carbon footprint yep, but absolutely. we won't go there today um <laughs> that's I, the next lecture that's the next lecture so i'd love to contextualize some of the context some of the content you provided right so what if we do a little role playing exercise? Sure. Um, and um, I'll be the large company. Okay. You can be the entrepreneur. Sure. Selling whatever you like. What am I selling? Um, how about something you've sold before? Hmm. Okay. And just take me through the steps of like where you start. Okay. So let's say, what what's the first step? Right. You're ready. You're so ready you, to sell. You have, so have we, have we communicated before? You've never communicated before. Okay. Right. So let's say you have a prototype yep. and that prototype is ready to, to grow, to scale. And you're looking for a company who will purchase that prototype to give you the, the capital to build it. Yeah. Right. So you're, you're kind of using that pre-purchase to actually build the product and you yep. want to sell it before beforehand but yeah but i have a prototype to show you yeah but you have like, a prototype ready yeah because i've seen companies try to sell before they even have that it's very difficult uh yeah. it's just a matter of a promise right i can promise you anything but if, if you don't have a prototype it's hard to to even visualize what it would look like um okay so i'm gonna sell you a uh a artificial intelligence driven chat bot which will reduce your customer service calls but Perfect. improve the, but improve your customer's experience. Awesome. So, um, yeah. So, so if you've never seen this before, so that's right. You've never seen the prototype. I just emailed you. You said, okay, let's talk. Okay. Right, so first of all, who did you email? Where did you start? What's your job title? Well, who do you email first? What's so for something like that, I would recommend like someone in innovation is usually a good, is a good person. Um, I actually like selling to people. So this is in the book, but uh, people yep. with innovation in the job title tend to be a little bit more open to new things. And they're also like rewarded for that too, because part of the reason like they're working in innovation is to bring new, new ideas to the company or new, new things. Um, they can be a little easier to deal with. And they're also very often, um, well connected internally to like get a pilot going. So yeah, I, like I would start there. That's probably the first, you know, the, the initial point of contact. Um, and usually from there, going back to like that corporate maze, you can use that person to like figure out who's the other people you need to talk to, to get this, uh, get this approved. Perfect. Um, okay. So yeah. So I email you, you respond, I guess. What do you say? What do you say in this email? Oh, so I, I basically, well, you're gonna make me write a cold email by verbally, but, uh, <laughs> um, 
So I, I just give you like a one or two sentences about the product. And those one or two sentences are not about the product. They're about how the product will help you. So I say, well, uh, Juliana, companies like yours uh, have an immense customer service burden. Uh, I, I, we're working on a, um, on a chat bot that can both reduce that burden, saving you money while also improving your customer's experience. I uh, would love to show this to you. Uh, when, do you have some time to chat in the next couple of weeks? So that's probably like some, something along those lines. Now, let's say I don't respond. I have hundreds of similar LinkedIn messages in my yep. inbox. In fact, right before this call, I was going through my LinkedIn messages and I'm like, wait, I have messages from 2017. You know, it's, it's taken me so long to catch up. Okay, so I don't respond, I don't see it. What do you do? Uh, so since this is a customer service thing, I might also go back to LinkedIn and look at, is there a head of customer experience or a um, head of customer service or VP customer service? Uh, something that's like directly tied to the value that my product is giving, send them a message. Then I'd probably email you again, uh, maybe a week later, I'd give you like a week then I, I'd probably email you again. I mean, there's a there's a stat that people use. Um, I don't know if I believe it, but I'll give you the stat. Uh, that is, you should do seven touch points before giving up, uh, mm -hmm. like follow up seven times. I, I don't know the if it works or not. Same person or with different? No, no, same person, people say. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I don't know if I believe it because I, I know when I'm on the receiving end of that, I hate it. So um, yeah. That's why I'm saying I don't know if I believe it. I do believe in following up a couple times, but if you if you message somebody three times, I'd say, and they don't respond, they're probably not either. They're not the right person, or they're just not interested, okay. or something is wrong with your subject line. Like it's one of those three things. So, so what what would be a good subject line for this? Um, something around like save money and well, for somebody in innovation, it would be like. Maybe I'd say like AI driven chatbot to improve customer experience or something, um, something like that. Because you, if you're in an innovation role, you probably do care about what's the technology under it, in addition to like what it actually does. Um, yeah, something along those lines. If it was just to somebody in customer service, like that second person I mentioned, right? I would just focus on like reduce customer service burden while improving uh, while improving your customer experience. Something like awesome. that. Uh, and what you always what, just want to think about what would this person care about, right? Or like, just try to put yourself in their shoes. Like what would, what would get you to open up an email, uh, if you were sitting in that, in that seat. Right. And what would a good follow-up sound like? Um, well this, if you could find, okay, this maybe is a pre COVID world. I don't think you could find this anymore. Uh, but if you could find their like phone number, sometimes following up by phone, if in an office phone, not their cell phone, please don't call people on their cell phone for sales calls. Um, but it, you know, in a pre COVID world, like many, many of these companies, especially in, uh, innovation roles, some of them will put like phone numbers on the website. Like they would say, okay, you know, this is our, our contact number. Uh, you can try calling. I I've seen that actually work fairly well because not that many people called those numbers. So if you could find like, you know, Procter & Gamble has an open innovation website. A lot of companies, L'Oreal has an open innovation website. Uh, a lot of companies do have these websites where they will post contact info. They'll post a phone number. Again, I don't know if anyone's looking at those phones now or if anyone's on the receiving end in a, in a COVID world. But pre-COVID, I know that those were, that was kind of like a sales hack. It was like, no, you know, very few companies would, would go and uh, actually take the time to call. Uh, so that can be a good kind of good way through the noise. If you were doing a follow-up email, if you're calling, if you're calling, yeah, if you're calling, you just mention the note. You say like, oh, you know, I, I uh, sent you a note last week, um, just to remind you, like, I'm a, I'm, I'm the entrepreneur working on uh, the product that reduces customer service burden while improving your experience, right? Like, it's just yeah. to just to remind them. So a it's lot similar of to pitching a journalist, right? You call, hey, of, I sent yes. you a story. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> yep. Kind of like that. Right. And like yeah. many times they may, you know, they're probably going to say like, well, I don't have time to talk about this right now, but uh, maybe we can schedule a follow-up if they're interested, if they're not interested at all, they'll say, oh, well, yeah, I saw that. I'm not, it's not relevant. Um, they say, okay, well, thank you. And that's it. Uh, at least with that contact. Now, if you do get rejected by let's say the innovation person, it doesn't mean that company doesn't want to buy. It mm -hmm. just means that that particular person or their group, it's not relevant to them. But maybe you contact the customer service person with that same 
you know, email or that same value proposition and they get back to you and they say like, this was, you know, because the customer service person is actually being judged on how much money they're spending on customer service and the customer experience. Right. So like maybe you're speaking to that person's needs better than the innovation person. So being rejected, I guess the, the broader point is being rejected by one person in the company doesn't mean you're rejected by the company. If that makes sense. No, no, no. It totally yeah. makes sense. Um, I'm really curious as to the office politics of it. Yeah. Right. So yep. could that seem as stepping on toes, right? So if you pitch the customer experience person after you pitch the innovation strategist, right? And the customer experience person then goes to the innovation strategist and says, hey, I had this entrepreneur approach me and I think it's great. Could they be like, oh, well, I already told them no, right? How can you minimize? Yeah, yeah I mean, they could. Um, yeah. Sometimes you got to like do the, you know, that phrase like uh, ask for forgiveness, not, not permission kind of thing. Right. Right. Uh, and just kind of like deal with that risk. Like many times, if it's that exact example that, that you just gave, I would say the customer service person's uh, opinion outweighs the innovation person. Like, I think the opposite would actually be worse, right? If you like pitch the customer service person, they say, no, this isn't relevant to us, or we already have something we use, or, you know, we prefer this vendor. And then you go to the innovation person and the innovation person says, uh, you know, oh, like I talked to this entrepreneur, it sounds really interesting. That would be worse because really the end of the day, the customer service person is the customer. Right, the innovation person is more like the channel to that customer. Uh, so yeah, I, I would be less worried. Just, I wouldn't worry too much about like that type of office politics. Um, that's more for them to deal with, right? Like the people on the corporate side, they have to deal with that every day. Uh, but you as an entrepreneur, I think wherever you can get in the door, like get in the door. Right, so don't right. worry too much about that. Obviously don't be stupid about it either. Like, you know, don't go harass like every employee in the department and just yeah, wait. Don't, don't like Google company name and then write every second degree connection you find. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. With the same yeah. message. Yep. While changing exactly. the name. Exactly. And sometimes people forget to change the name too. That's yeah. extra fun. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah. So just don't be like, don't be stupid about it, but like generally don't worry about the office politics. If you're the entrepreneur, that's for the corporate people to worry about. Right. Right. Okay. So let's say. They take the call, you show them the, the demo, they like it, what's next? What's your next move? Uh, well, if they like that, then I would ask, um, you know, what other, is, so if they're the innovation person, right? That's going back to that example. Yeah. Or is it the customer service person? You're the, you pitch the innovation person. The innovation person talks to the customer service person. They're like, yeah, that sounds cool. That's I'll great. take another meeting. Yep. You, you talk to them about it, then what? Uh, and we have another meeting after about the, after that and the customer service person also likes it um then i think we'd start talking like next steps i would say like well you know what's the uh what makes sense as a as a way to test this out to see how it works in your organization okay. uh, and the customer service person may say well you know we have this one small uh customer service group here that would be a good place to try it um, or they may say we have this app maybe we want to implement this in the app because it's quick to do it that way like they may have their own ideas of what way to pilot but I would start guiding it towards a pilot. Like that would be the next step uh, mm -hmm. if they're both interested or if they seem resistant to the pilot idea, I would then ask, uh, you know, are there other people within the organization that we should, uh, we should, you know, connect with to start um, figuring out wh what makes sense for next steps. So it could be, it could be maybe they, the, the customer service person wants to loop in the IT person because it's something to do with technology. So they say, well, you know, I need to get their opinion also before I can say yes to a pilot or no to a pilot. I want to uh, contextualize this for someone who I know is watching. Um, and it's a, it's a security company. So it's a high, high risk technology that cannot really be implemented for a small group of people. It's like an all or nothing kind yeah. of technology that has huge upsides, right? If it works. And I, I believe it, it has and it will, but um, if there isn't a possibility of piloting, what is a way you can provide either a measure of safety yep. to the company without- So it's less pilot? risky. So yeah. it's less risky without a pilot. Mm -hmm. um, you could do it where there is a guarantee, like in the sense that, um, like if, 
I guess at the end of the day, everybody's worried about risk and like perceived risk. And, you know, am I going to look bad to my boss or am I going to be the reason why the company has, you know, some problems? So in that case, if you can't do a pilot, perhaps one way to do it would be that they get like a three month trial period in the sense that, okay, we implement it, but you're not locked into any kind of like one year contract or anything like that. You can, you can basically say this isn't working um, and we go our separate ways. So that's effectively a pilot, but it's on a full scale. The other way to do it would be um, offer a refund, like say like, you know, we're going to implement it, but then uh, you don't pay until month three or month two, you know, whatever you figure out the timeline because every product needs a certain amount of data, right. To, to say whether it's working or not. Um, but you could say, okay, if it's going well after three months, you know, then the payments start kicking in, but then, you know, I guess then you don't get paid until after three months. But uh, you should always, always ask for money for the pilot. I, I definitely agree. Yeah. Always, always. Yeah. A hundred percent. And it's okay to offer a refund if it doesn't work or if there isn't satisfaction, but always ask for money. Yeah. It's easier to give the, the thing is like 99 times out of a hundred, they're not going to ask for a refund because what you're doing is probably better than what was there before, honestly. Uh, so it's easy to offer that. I mean, you of course have to be prepared to give it, you know, if you offer the a refund, but uh, yeah, I think like definitely ask for money. And then if they do need a refund after it's better to get that than not charge in the first place. Awesome. Okay. So fast forward, that goes splendid, right? The, the pilot goes splendid or some things um, fail, but they require very small adjustments. What, so what then, happens? Uh, so now we're talking next steps, like full scale implementation. Right. So, well, then I would talk to them about, um, cause then at that point, you'd probably be talking to a group called procurement, most likely, um, who tends to negotiate these full scale type of contracts. Maybe you'd still be interacting with like the customer, um, you know, kind of customer service or something. Uh, but from like an agreement standpoint and a payment standpoint, uh, procurement would definitely be involved. <clears throat> and we'd probably talk like cost is obviously the big thing right? Like come up with a cost that makes sense for both sides. I, I, as I said, during the presentation, pretty sure they would ask for uh, a slight discount if they're going to implement in the whole company. Right. And you, you should be prepared. Don't offer it necessarily up front because maybe they don't want it, but have that in your toolkit, basically. Like if there's, you know, they're saying, well, like, you know, we really want to do this, but 50,000 a month is steep, right. For this thing or 500,000 a month is steep. Like we want to do, uh, you know, then, then just know that you're, they're fishing for a discount, which you probably at that point should give if they're going to implement like company wide. Uh, so just be prepared for that. And that, that part makes sense, right? It's like a volume discount. If you're, if you're buying it for that many seats or that many uh, licenses or whatever the unit is that you're using, um, that's a, that should just be expected that you're going to probably have to give that. Uh, and but you yeah. also probably add, create room in that to renegotiate. Right, exactly. because there might be a, a cost to the mass production or the scaling of the product that you did not foresee until yes. you implemented the discount. Right. Yes, that's a good You're point. Like, oh wait, I actually have to pay for a lot more data in the cloud, so I didn't think of this or whatever yeah. it may be. There's also good ways to make up for that difference. So um, a lot of companies are used to paying like an onboarding fee. Uh, for anything, right? Like there's, if you, I don't know if you've heard of CB insights, like the, it's like a research tool that a lot of large companies use. The cheapest license is like $55,000 a year. And it goes up like, so it's like a, you know, like basically they're like an outsourced research team, basically. That's how they, they kind of pitch themselves. Um, and they have like all these digital tools also. So they have a $10,000 onboarding fee. I don't know what they're onboarding because it's like not that complicated but they charge a $10,000 onboarding fee and companies pay. I mean, that's just like, they pay it. So you can make up for like the volume discount a lot of times with like, okay, we're going to offer you an onboarding. Again, it goes back to like, of course it depends on what your, your, your uh, product is, but if it is, let's say a digital product or a security product, you can say, well, we'll hand, you know, we'll work with your team, uh, you know, walk with you step-by-step step through the implementation uh, onboard all your users. And, you know, for that, there's like a, $10,000 onboarding fee. And maybe that makes up for the volume discount. <laughs> so it ends up being like the same, but they feel like, oh, well, we're getting something extra uh, for our money. Right, so there's, right. 
there's something to that. Like you can say, okay, self-service is, you know, maybe normal price is $10 a month. Self-service is with the discount, it's $8 a month. But then, we, you know, there's a $10,000 onboarding fee if you want us to kind of help you with the implementation or whatever, you know, the amounts work out to. But you can probably make up for the volume discount sometimes with the um, onboarding. The only difference is that's like a one-time fee, right? right? It's not like a recurring right. thing. So let's say you do, you, you, you sign up into a year long deal for a price that is less than favorable. So you're working for very little margins. Hmm. How can you well, create keep room improving the, the contract? Keep improving, the product. keep improving the product. That's like one thing you can do. Uh, new features that are not included with the first product, right? That they subscribe to related products because you're probably going to learn stuff during that year that like, oh, well, you know, we have this, we, we sold them this customer service tool, but maybe now there's like an alert tool that like, you know, high, like big problem customer complaints get elevated to a higher level person automatically or something. You know, I'm just making this up like this, like alert product. It's a related product. It's an add-on product. So now we can sell you the add-on product too for an extra $5 a month per user or whatever, you know, whatever it is, but it's like, you can use that first contract. Let's say, you know, you, I hope you're not losing money on the first contract, uh, right. but you're at, let's say you're just breaking even, but you're in the door. You can use that as like, like a beachhead basically to, uh, to sell additional things that are related, which hopefully you'll be making more money on. And the other thing is it's always easier to sell to an existing customer than to a new customer. So if they already are having a great experience with the first product that you sold them, it's probably easier to sell the second one. Yeah, of course. Okay, so you're in. You're in. Yay. Anything else? Or champagne. True. I made the sale. True. Yeah. <laughs> cider. Um, yeah, the cider. Corner <laughs> company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then you're saying, what's the next step from there? Like, we're in, the deal is done. Um, let's go find the next customer. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Thank you so much. For 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 walking walking us through that process and for this great workshop i appreciate you being here with us and if you're watching we're going to be raffling some of neil's books oh cool. uh, so feel free to write us um a question or, or a big takeaway that you took from today's lesson and we will be raffling them to the people that write in thank you so 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 much yeah, this was so much fun. Thanks. This is uh, this is great. Thank you. Thank you. I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, definitely. Stay tuned. I'm going to stop the live stream. Sure.